Hey Breakerspace, Dave here. In our making of Breakerspace series, we have already covered the light and the mic. But videography is a very essential part of the entire process. And today we are going to cover it. While we are talking about videography, it's not just we are talking about the camera selection. But we are also going to talk about the gears that we are using, what are the modifications that we are making, as well as the encoding settings and what's the end result is going to look like. And why are we making those choices? In terms of camera selections, we have a GoPro Hero 6, we have a Pixel 7, and we are also using a Nikon P1000. Now, these three cameras cover three different niches. We don't have any dedicated cinema camera or a mirrorless camera, but that's for the future. Thousand subscribers. Honestly, this is more than enough to go around and make videos. Now, before I do a quick comparison between these three cameras and what am I selecting them for, which purpose, this week, Amazon just sunset DP Review as one of the photography journalism site, a very well regarded one. And it goes to show splitting hairs around camera specs is not really as useful as it once was. Because feature wise, homogeneity has come to the point where if you're not getting a result out of a camera, it's mostly on the camera operator and not so much on the camera. However, depending on the niche of which kind of camera you're using, you can expect different kind of results. So I made this quick list of factors that matters the most for me for the three cameras that I am using. First of which is the AI processing. My Google Pixel does a heavy amount of AI processing and uh, that's something that other two cameras don't actually do. However, because of that, my Pixel hits up a lot. So if I am recording something on 4K 60fps, sometimes it might get to the point where the camera shuts off. Something to keep in mind, not, might not happen all the time. This is a problem that I don't have with my Nikon P1000. P1000 records absolutely fine 4K 60fps for as long as I want to record it. Well, the GoPro also has overheating issues, but it's not as rampant. On other factors, for example, the color accuracy, I don't know what to say about Google Pixel because it just looks nicer, it might not be as accurate, and I don't have equipments to actually tell apart whether the color is right or wrong, objectively, but I'm working on it. Maybe in some future projects we'll make a color emitter. On the color accuracy side and white balance, Nikon P1000 does excellent job at it, and so does the GoPro, but it has its own color science if you want to choose that. Aside from that, another key important factor is the focal length of your lens and the distance of the subject that you're shooting. Now, I am not using detachable lens on any of my cameras, so it's pretty much whatever the camera is natively capable of shooting the best, in which case the GoPro shoots better at infinite focus. You want everything to be in focus range. It's a very deep depth of field. The P1000 is capable of shooting at a great distance. It actually has a telephoto lens attached and it handles even up to one kilometer distance very well. The trouble is if you're trying to shoot something in less than two meter range, then it basically has a very deep depth of field. It does not have a shallow depth of field effect. So it makes it for a very poor choice for portrait photography or talking head video shoot. So on that regard, Pixel comes up as a winner. This is also due to the fact that the Pixel actually has the largest sensor size of all these three cameras, counterintuitive as it might be. So in order to get a nice bokeh effect, Pixel is my best bet for the time being. Thousand subscribers. Now, one of the key element of being able to shoot at any situation is the light condition. And my Pixel is the least picky of all the other devices, which makes it so that even at a very low light, I can get a shot that is kind of usable. I don't intend to use that as much, but if I wanted to, this would be my best bet. GoPro does not do so well, but it just has decent enough, moderate enough performance. And P1000 is very poor at any kind of low light situations. It cannot absolutely be used under any condition without a good light setup. Another thing to keep in mind is the battery runtime. Because most of the time when I'm shooting, I'm not getting to charge my devices at the same time. I can for most of the devices, but mostly I'm not. It's not as convenient. So it helps to have a higher or longer duration of battery life. The GoPro gives almost 
45 minutes to an hour of battery runtime, whereas the Pixel gives me about an hour worth of runtime. And the P1000 runs for over an hour. Now, with all that said, how to set up a camera, how to run and gun, how fast is it to get going and start shooting something, that matters a lot. The GoPro is probably the easiest one of them all. You don't have to open any app, you don't have to go through any lock screen. You just press a button and it's recording. That's very convenient. So that's clearly a winner here. The close second is the Google Pixel where it re does require me to go through the lock screen and open an app. But other than that, I know the shots that I'm getting will always be pretty much usable. But for P1000, unless we set it up with all the variables taken care of, we have taken the test shot and verified that the test shot works and there is no grain, the subject is in focus, etc, etc. It might not give you the best result. With all that said, there's one key element left, that is the modifiability how much customization we can apply on any of those cameras. Turns out, actually a lot. We can add custom macro lenses on the GoPro. We can do the same with 3D printed frames or off-the-shelf clips to add lenses on the Pixel. But when it comes to the P1000, it's a bit tricky because it's a very heavy camera and there's not a lot of ways to mount something else in front of its lens. So one thing we can do is to try and turn it into a macro lens by adding a convex lens in front of it with an UV filter as a base. Okay. Can you also explain what are you doing? So this is a UV filter for a camera like this, which you can just put on, screw on in front of the main lens, right? Now the thing is, if I can add the lens on top of this, then I should be able to mount the lens all together on the camera. Let's try doing that. So first thing first, this is a lens that was part of my soldering kit. I don't use it, I don't need it for the most part. Whenever I'm doing any precision soldering, I have um, different lens for that purpose, which is a digital microscope. So this is actually not required for me at all, uh, which makes it so that I can put it up. Maybe we can glue it together and then it can go on. Let, let me try doing that. Time to get glue. Okay, this is what I was talking about. So I just need a few drops of glue in this particular case right now because I just want to put this on top of this and uh oh, yes, it has to be somewhat aligned. So it's not tightly glued in enough, but I just want to see whether it fits in here. Okay, this is not the final version but this is a trial version camera turned on you will have to come this way to understand what's happening in here okay. on principle this works like if you come in here and see the if i focus on the drink right oh yes i can see so you can see the book yeah the drink is in focus so close and the background is like totally blurred right all right so with that said i think it needs a little more work thankfully the glass has no stains whatsoever at all so for the second attempt we cleaned up the surfaces and applied the glue a little carefully and let it dry for a few hours before putting it on the camera again So the lens is now firmly attached with the filter adapter. Now it should be okay enough for us to put this thing on. Let's attach it to the camera and see how does it see. There's a pin cushion distortion that you can see, right? On the corner, corners are a little bit pin cushiony. It's as you can see, right? But if I zoom in a little bit, 
Then the GoPro, it's mm -hmm. just about oh, less than a feet away, but it's perfectly in focus with a telephoto lens. And the tripod, which is just over a feet away, is already having, is bloody, is having shallow depth of field, right? So that means that we are getting that effect that we were looking for. And if I take the lens off, like in live mode, right? Okay, so if I take the lens away, oh. now, now you can see, I think I should have recorded the video the whole time. Okay, let me, let me record it, right? Start recording the video. Mm -hmm. You can see that, hey, the GoPro is in focus, but so is the tripod. Okay. The, only the wall is a little bit out of focus. But now I'm attaching the lens and suddenly, the GoPro is in focus, but the tripod isn't anymore. So this is a very close focus essentially. It's a very shallow depth of field. Oh, yes. Right? I'm pretty happy with this. Seems fine to me, um, as in it seems very doable. If we had a camera with a larger sensor size, we could have gotten a very nice shot with this modification. Thousand subscribers. Stop it. Get some help. Okay. One thing to notice here though, if you are trying to make the same kind of modifications with an added lens, be aware of the pin cushion distortion and chromatic aberration that comes along with it on the corners of your frame. There are a few ways to avoid it. One of the easiest way is by using a Fresnel lens. Give it a try. It might just give you a great result. So based on all that, I've decided that I'm going to use the pixel for my primary camera for recording all my talking head videos and other shots. I'm going to use the GoPro because it has the HDMI output, clean HDMI output. I'm going to use that as a streaming camera as well as the work desk camera for recording me working on things. Um, also, I can use that for running and shots. And uh, the P1000 can help me with long exposure, telephoto scenes and stuff like that. And sometimes I can mix and match depending on the situation. All right, so with all that said and done, there's one other thing that we need to do here because I'm really terrible at speaking in front of camera. I need some kind of visual cue in order to continue speaking. I'm not very good at winging it. I kind of need my visual cue in from form of the other person's expressions to understand if I'm making sense, if at all. So when I'm speaking in front of camera, I tend to lose my track and focus on what I'm talking about. Even though this video is completely pretty much unscripted and I'm trying to wing it, I don't know how much is it coming along, but I intend to use a teleprompter to avoid this situation. Maybe at some point in time, I'll get better at this and leave that training wheel. But for now, I kind of need a teleprompter to be able to stay on my lane. Let's get started with that. All right, so let's see what we have got in here, okay? So first thing first, we have this frame. Uh, this is the base frame. It has some hook and loops on the body so that we can attach its attachments like this visor that comes with it, uh, which will block the light from coming in or reflecting back and forth into the camera. This is the plate where on top of which we can keep the mobile phone or the tablet for the teleprompter. Uh, this is the glass. This is what will be the pass-through glass for the camera as well as the reflector for the teleprompter. We already talked about the visor that holds things back, but there's also a light blockage extra um, hood that comes along with it. I might not use it, but it's good to have it. Uh, Along with that, this is the frame on top of which you can mount the camera. That's pretty good. I like it. Uh, by the way, along with that, I see that there's, there are two batteries and I was confused like what is it about? It actually came up with uh, this teleprompter 
um, remote control we'll figure it out after so that's it for the unboxing and uh, the overview of the ProShot teleprompter we'll set it up and let's see how it works So now that we have everything set up and ready to go, one more thing that we need to discuss still is in which format are we gonna edit it and publish it. My instinct was to go with 4K60 because that's just cool and all my devices pretty much support 4K60. However, I'm coming to a realization where working with just HD videos is just much easier in terms of the storage requirement, in terms of the process flow, as well as how fast is it to get around processing stuff and render it and publish it. And the AI upscalers have come to a point where if I want to upscale it to 4K60 FPS, I can do that, as well as Nvidia's new drivers are allowing you to do that while you are watching it on a pre-rendered video as well. So. We are heading to a point where working on a 4K project is kind of diminishing return. So I'm gonna give it a try for a while to see how my setup is working out. And if I see that the result is subpar, I might still switch back to 4K60 back again, especially for breaker space. So that's it guys. I know today was less making, more talking, but we'll come back with a lot of teardowns and mix for the next episode. Stay tuned for that, like if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, subscribe, see you in the next one. Meanwhile, I'm coming to the realization that even though I'm setting up the teleprompter, this is about the time when I don't need the teleprompter anymore. I'm pretty much able to speak in front of the camera and not require the training wheel. I just have some points noted down here and that's pretty much it.